Yes. So, um, yeah, then I will just say a couple of words. Um, I don't know if you see me, but I think you see my name, Maria Wagner. Actually, um, yeah, I'm very happy to welcome you to this workshop today. Um, I am the head of GamesNet, and what we do is we try to connect the um, Berlin Game Studios to the studios from all over the world, and we also um, enhance knowledge exchange, and that is what we also do today. Um, that's why we organized the workshop together with Joachim Achren, who you actually can see, <laughs> hey. and yeah, and who will take over just now. Um, yeah, I'm very happy that you're with us, and yeah, enjoy the. Uh, workshop and uh, if you have any questions just drop them in the chat um, if you want like we we will have a Q&A after the presentation but if something is really urgent just let me know I will manage the chat and yeah yeah so please enjoy thanks Maria hey hey everyone it's really awesome to to kind of share you uh, more knowledge I've been I've been doing a few webinars on my website uh, in the past few months. And this is like the first time I'm partnering up with somebody else. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting to, to see how, it, how this goes and uh, happy to take a lot of questions after the presentation. So I have like 30 slides here. Uh, I'm gonna start going into the slides and please keep the, the chat like live. And you can also write, if you have specific questions, please use the Q and A section in in zoom for for asking those ones all right sharing my chrome all right hope you can see it let's go in okay so today's topic beginner's guide to investor money in gaming what is it all about first an introduction on on myself and how how i've work with VC. So I'm Joachim Akren, the founder and CEO of Elite Game Developers, which is a company with the mission to help gaming entrepreneurs so that they would thrive in building games companies. I have a podcast with the same name, Elite Game Developers. We have 60 episodes now for interviewing founders and investors. Uh, you can look it up on Spotify, uh, iTunes, everywhere. And then we have a blog uh, on the EliteGameDevelopers.com site, where there's week, weekly articles. Just last week, I pub published an article on how do you like give out uh, stock options in a gaming startup, which is starting to grow, and like how do you make sure that the early employees get like their fair share of you know the upside that might come later. And then I had a book came out a few weeks ago uh, called Long Term Game. You can find it on Amazon. The audio book has been delayed, but it should be out in May. So look out for that. And then we have online courses. We just launched a new one, which I will talk about at the end of the presentation today. So my background in gaming, I was a co-founder at Next Games, which is a Helsinki-based uh, mobile games developer and publisher. Uh, we built games like Walking Dead, No Man's Land, and Walking Dead, Our World. And now they're developing uh, the Stranger Things game in Helsinki, which will be coming out hopefully in the near future. Uh, I left last year to start Elite Game Developers. I just wanted to go to, to do something else. The company is doing well and fine. I, I had the, the ambition to try out this kind of like helping, building a company that helps entrepreneurs because I love, love to work with entrepreneurs and help them and see them develop themselves. So I was an early employee at Supercell as well. This was in between two companies. So I founded my first games company in 2005 called Iron Star Helsinki, which was a a virtual worlds like developer for uh, back back in the day Nokia phones so you can probably understand that that wasn't didn't make any sense uh, it was like very early no iPhone in sight 
so we struggled, but we eventually uh, changed to doing Facebook games and managed to build a nice business until Facebook decided to click, kill all their viral channels. Uh, and that was when I went to Supercell. We closed down that company. I learned a lot at Supercell. I'm going to talk about that a lot today as well. So my experiences with venture capital, with investor money in gaming, I, I raised my first round of investments in 2007. It was about like 150,000 euros uh, of uh, seed funding for Iron Star. Uh, that, that money really lasted for, for a while. We were a very lean team of six people taking like small salaries, uh, eventually raised half a million as well. And then we pivoted to Facebook. Uh, it was a really good, interesting time to learn about like how investors think. But the problem at, back then was that there wasn't really anybody who specialized in gaming investments. Uh, the investors were mostly these kind of generalist funds. There was a lot of B2B uh, investors, uh, especially in the Nordics, which was really difficult because we were a consumer product, uh, direct to consumer, especially. Uh, since we were distributing our own games already. At that Supercell, I noticed kind of this uh, change where there was uh, early angel investors in Supercell who had built games companies and they were very uh, strategic in helping the company to, to like go to the next level. So the, I think they, they first bootstrapped the company for a year. And then when I was joining, they had just raised 12 million from Axel Partners with this kind of like big vision and the, the team that had a lot of experience. And I left at the time when, when the company was, you know, growing like crazy. Clash of Clans was out for a few months already and every day making more and more money. And I, I decided that this is like the right opportunity to, to build another games company. And the timing was really right. So we, we raised 400,000, uh, a few months after starting Next Games with the founding team. And then a year later, uh, we went out to raise a Series A round of 8 million, just as Supercell had been sold to, to SoftBank. So timing was really good there. That's one element I'm going to talk today about, a lot about this timing, what's going on in the market and the appetite of investors. But the, the, the landscape has changed so much in these recent years. There's so many gaming VCs. So here you see the logos of, of eight really like prominent VCs. You have Makers Fund, Londo Venture Partners, Play Ventures, Griffin Gaming Partners, Bitcraft, Level Up, Sisu, Transcend, and dozens more. There's so many who, who have investment teams who know gaming, who have built games companies, who know what it, lo what it looks like when an entrepreneur knows what they're talking about versus not knowing. I think that was the main difference uh, like 13 years ago when I was raising for my first startup, the investors didn't know what is like, what sounds like a really good business opportunity and what doesn't. So they were investing blindly, but that has changed a lot now. So, just like zooming out a bit here, uh, funding in gaming, what does it look like? Well, first off, the options. You have crowdfunding, people putting money into to like through these vehicles like Kickstarter, Indiegogo. That's a, an option that has been around for a while. Then you have publishers like doing these strategic opportunities that they, they want to grow and they're funding developers. This is happening happened in PC for ages. But now it's sort of like coming into mobile where you have Voodoo, for instance, is paying publishers uh, that the same is with Lion Studios, like these hyper casual publishers, the, they're willing to pay the best developers to actually build quickly these games to, to have a really growing portfolio. And then they might acquire even the companies. So there's a lot of activity there. You have user acquisition credit like Sugar in the UK, uh, Poland VC who are giving you these kind of like credit lines against a return on investment that, that comes, you know, very soon. So there's a lot of interest there as well. And then what I'm really focusing today on is this equity-based financing, which is 
the investor getting a share of the company when they give you money. So it's mostly angels, angel investors and VCs. And we will focus on VC today. So what is VC? Uh, venture capitals uh, people are usually running funds. So they have a pile of money that they raised. And I want to spend time today first on thinking about this whole thing from the perspective of the VC. So I, I think it really matters a lot that you know like what these guys are doing. This is Play Ventures. The, these folks, Harry and Henrik, I know them. They're both Finnish guys. They raised a fund recently. Uh, I think a year and a half ago, they, they finalized it in January 2019. They started operating a $50 million fund. It's early stage investments. And they typically invest 50000 to million, two million uh, into startups. How do they actually make money? What is the model of a VC? So when they have an exit, they first need to return the fund to the actual LPs that put money in there. So Play Ventures, they invest typically 500,000. Let's, let's put an example here, like half a million into a startup and they get 20%. Okay, something like that. It's, it really depends on the situation, but just, you know, this is an example that might happen. And then what happens? The startup is sold in a few years. It's like, you know, they have the hit game, which goes to the top of the list. And it's sold for 400 million to sing, uh, you know, somebody big comes along and buys them. So how does that look for Play Ventures? Well, they own 20% of the company. Let's say that the company didn't raise any more money and the people who were owners in the company still had the same percentage of the company. So out of 400 million, that means that 80 million is coming to the fund. Well, the profit you say is like, you had a $50 million fund, so it's returned. Out of that 80 million that came from this transaction, uh, there's still 30 million left as profit. So out of that profit, 20%, which is 6 million is carried interest fee, which is what uh, the general partners, Harry and Hendrik would get. So this is kind of like the, the profit mechanism that is going around there. There's a lot of like this, hey, we want to return the fund, uh, this kind of thought process going on. And then we want to have that profit because that's where we make the big returns on top of like our monthly salary. So what that, what does that mean? So it, it sounds sort of like easy, but what usually happens is VCs typically do about 40 investments from a fund. They might do 30, 50. It really depends on what, what, what the deal flow looks like. But rarely there are more than three that make hundreds of millions from uh, a fund. And usually there's a lot of these kind of seven figure exits where the team sold quite early, maybe there was something that, you know, somebody came along and gave them 50 million, hey. And then what happens to, to the fund? Well, they get, you know, 10 million out of this 50 million and they're now one fifth back, like returned of the fund. So they need to get, still get 40 million back to the fund before they start seeing profits. So a large portion still of all of these investments that they do will still fail. They run out of money, the product doesn't work, there's other problems that happen. So why are we talking from this VC perspective? The key here is that you need to understand the VC's business to actually like get money from them. It's not so that you know, you're selling to them, but you don't understand your customer when you're selling your business to a VC. That's a big mistake that I, I stumbled upon still at Next Games, that I wasn't thinking hard enough about like understanding my customer when I'm pitching my company and the customer is the VC. So what they are really going after is big outcomes. They want to have these $100 million exits. That's how they operate. If they don't shoot for that, it's sort of like they they don't really like then pick the right kind of like bets. If they're betting on something going big uh, versus something, you know, hey, we're making a cool game, you know, do you want to invest? That doesn't really sound like something that might come 
become a big thing. So they will do what they can to help you succeed for sure. And they will want to dream kind of like big with you as well when you're working on, on an idea. So they're not going to you know, be very conservative about thinking like, hey, let's do a small business here. Maybe it grows 2x next year. But rather like, hey, let's grow it to 10x uh, or 100x in, in five years and see where it goes. And what you need to know, it's not alone. The VC will be with you until the end of the road. So there are, they are owners in the company. And the good thing is you can use them because they are there to support you. If they're not doing that, like they shouldn't be in this business uh, if they're not really adding any value besides giving the money and then sitting back. And they, they are also going to be you know, not doing a favor for themselves if they're not involved in understanding what are the issues with their companies. So let's look at a few example cases here of uh, companies getting funded. I won't name a name for this company, but this is a company in Finland that raised uh, a bit over half a million from VCs last year. So how did this all happen? The first steps, what they did was part of the team had already left their previous jobs and uh, the rest of the team were still working, taking a salary, but they, and they hadn't communicated to their, you know, employers that, Hey, I'm going to leave for this startup. So it, it's kind of like part of the team was halfway out and the, the, the rest of the team was still working. Uh, so the CEO had left and he was reaching out to angel investors about this idea. And he had, they had built a prototype in their spare time uh, with this team so that they had something to show when they go and pitch. So then they started to pitch to VCs. After meeting a few angels to practice their pitch, they approached the first VCs and they got one VC interested after seeing the prototype and having the discussions. Uh, so then they got a term sheet, which is a, it's a paper which outlines what are the terms for an, an investment. And they reviewed it and they signed it pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, but they even didn't have a company yet registered uh, when they signed this paper. So then they started leaving uh, their previous jobs. And a few months later, they had the company. So here you can see a timeline of six months. The idea happened. The team starts creating the prototype, first, first pitches to angel investors. And once this pitch is perfect, they met with VCs, had a term sheet quite quickly, and they started the company. Uh, the rest of the team joined and the money arrives. So what I usually see is there, there aren't many cases where a company would have raised in under four months. So six months is very typical of a kind of like start to finish of process of raising money from investors. So another example here. So Game Jam, this is a hyper casual studio based in Vietnam. Uh, the, this is a really cool thing because the, the founder, he's from the US, Christian Calderon. He, he's, you, you should check out this video on YouTube where he talks about the future of hyper casual. This is kind of an example that I'm betting that when Christian was pitching uh, Game Jam to investors, he went through the same talks that he's talking in this video about like how he visions the whole thing evolving in the future. And he had the knowledge. He had worked at Kixai, at Ketchup for several years, being the chief revenue officer. And when this kind of like guy with this kind of caliber leaves to start his own studio, it's pretty pretty quickly you're, you're going to see investments happening into the company. And I think Play Ventures was one of the first to spot Christian leaving and writing the check. So uh, this is like one of these crucial elements. If you're thinking about, hey, why are these people getting the investment so easily? So domain, domain expertise in gaming matters so much. Like I, I think I bump into this uh, so often in gaming that I'm talking to people who are starting their own company, but they lack certain aspects of knowing 
how games are developed nowadays. There's a lot of data-driven approaches. Uh, you know, an entrepreneur might know that, hey, this is the game I want to build. Nobody's done it before. But then when they go and have the game ready, they put it out on the app store. Then they're like, oh no, what do I do now? Like, uh, there's no money coming in. Then they look, hey, retention is 35%. Retention day one is 35%. Now what? And then it starts to crumble down. They had the game idea, but they don't have the approach to take what to do then after the first version is out. So uh, there's a lot of reasons why this is important for the investor. They're, they're going to know, want to know that you know what you're building and what kind of business you're in. Uh, knowledge about the market is really important. It's not just about the technical skills, about knowing Unity, having people who built uh, you know, games before, but it's more about this kind of like, you know what the customer is, what they want, what they need, uh, and you can articulate that well. Uh, it's, it's something you can pick up already. If you're working in gaming right now, like go into kind of like go in that, that realm of understanding what the customer is doing, and that will bring your domain expertise in the, the investor's eyes so much higher since you're, you're knowledgeable about where the market is going and what the customer needs now versus what they needed a year ago. And I'll give you a final example here. So if you don't have the A-class team, like people who were at Ketchup and Kixai, like being their chief revenue officer, whatnot, if you don't have these people, what do you do? Well, then my big suggestion is that you need to go after something bold, bigger than life kind of vision. But that doesn't need to be like, uh, like not grounded in reality. You can start off somewhere like, hey, this is the first game we're going to do. We're going to learn these things regarding something big about the market that nobody else knows. And this is where we're going after. I was just recently talking to a company who wants to, you know, bring music into mobile games. Like how, how do you bring, bring like music games into mobile? And they were, their first approach was to just build a game, which is an idle game where you, you're a DJ, uh, which is interesting. It's, it's a lot of like music, but they were mostly like, hey, we're gonna try a lot of uh, music games and see which one has the right KPIs so we can start scaling and bringing in brands. But I was like, the pitch doesn't really sound bold enough. And these guys didn't have any gaming experience. They had one person who had worked in a games company before, so they could build products. But it wasn't bold enough to kind of like, hey, this is the story that we're starting from something small. We're growing gradually bigger. Uh, we're just taking small steps. That was missing in the story. They were more, more or less pitching a game. And if that game's game fails, they're going to be, you know, staring into the distance because they, they weren't building something bigger. They were just building one game at a time. So kind of like backing off of that thought and more reflecting on each game being a step towards understanding something bigger. Like that, for them, the, the story is now shaping into more about like discovering music in mobile and not mattering too much if one game fails they're still going to be learning and pushing forward their own knowledge so you you want to still think about how, how you can prove what you're building through this, those games so it's definitely going to be important to have prototypes in the future as well but spend time re researching what others have done in the similar field that where you are and reflect that into your pitch and to your discussions with your investor. And start off with angel investors. Don't go immediately to, to meeting Makers Fund or Play Ventures, because those guys will, you know, they will hear that you have a lot of flaws in your pitch. So it's better to start off with somebody who's, you know, not gonna uh, be too much like the, the best possibility you could find, but rather, the you know friends and family or from your own network if you know anybody who knows things about vc get them to read your pitch like hear your pitch and give feedback and of course like 
start really lean pay like small salaries show that you can progress without angel money or investor money at first and and final thing i wanted to share today is the coronavirus and how that's affecting gaming investment so what to expect like i think currently there's not going to be a problem at the early stage there's still going to be seed investments happening mostly because the situation there is that these developers are not going to be launching you know in two months but it's always going to be like a, a longer 12 month project where they have several games that they're going to try out with the money that they're raising and it's always good to have this kind of story of hey we're building a 10-year journey here so it doesn't really matter if 2020 is kind of like you know over for uh, the whole world already and we are already looking at 2021 22 23 and we're just starting so but of course the the thing that is currently harder is that if you've already raised money earlier and now you're running out of money that's where i've heard already examples of startups uh getting like no because you know they their their business isn't profitable yet they're not even close to to that point so it's much going to be much harder for those people to raise so those people need to change their strategy but if you're sort of like approaching the first investment ever for your company, then things are business as usual. That's what I think. So before ending this, I want to give you a small discount from my course, which I'm doing. So there's a pitch your games company online course on the elite game developers website. I have lecture videos, templates there, and I also do three live sessions over Zoom with these people who who purchased the course. So if you go to elitegamedevelopers.com slash pitch, uh, and you can use the code Berlin to get 20% off until Friday evening this week. So check it out guys. And uh, I'm gonna open it up for questions now. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um... Yeah, it was really, really interesting. And we already have the first question, if you check out the uh, Q&A. Yes. I'm going to stop sharing first. Let's see how I, ah, wrong button. Here you go. All right. Do you know of any project financing solutions besides Kickstarter? And how do you rate those compared to equity in investments? Uh, Besides Kickstarter, at least in Finland, we have this crowdfunding thing called Investor, which is basically, it is an equity based investment for like, you know, the masses. So there are options uh, besides Kickstarter, Indiegogo. I think you can just Google for them and look it up. I don't have personal experience from them and I don't really work with companies who have done that. I'm mostly in the equity side, but I think there are a lot of resources out there online on these topics. Uh, next question, what would be a great point to start in meeting angel investors? I think when you have a sort of like the early idea and some early concepts and you've kind of validated from people in gaming that this makes sense. Like that if you come outside of gaming and you start thinking about, hey, I have an idea for this cool, you know, board game that I'm going to make on mobile. And you don't have any under like uh, previous experience from making games. I would first recommend that you talk to game developers in your own network to get feedback before you go to angel investors, because then it will be kind of like you, you will sort of figure out the, the, the blind spots that you have regarding making games. After you remove those blind spots, then I would already talk to investors. Uh, what's typical for angel investor equity structure? Let's say for 150,000 and how and can that have a downside for later rounds? Yeah, there's a, for angel investors, it's always very critical to, to stay away from giving them too much equity early on. Uh, I advise people to think about this 
because there's this valuation for your company. If like in this question, you said 150,000, for instance, can you justify that your company is already worth 1 million? I think that is always a good place to start taking investor money. If you cannot justify, can you go a bit further without investor money? And then like with some progress, making a better prototype, getting more experienced people to join the team, can you get to that 1 million and then raise the 150,000? I think that's, it's so crucial to keep as much shares as possible with the founders early on. So that's why I always advise, don't raise before you can justify 1 million valuation for your company. Uh, what resources do you see as, the required, uh, as required for the pitch? How functional and aesthetic should uh, a prototype like have? Well, I would say you can use something like Unity Asset Store graphics for your prototype. That's very much common nowadays. A lot of people even soft launch their first like test uh, games with Unity, Unity Asset Store graphics. So don't hire an artist to build those. Just, you know, buy something from asset stores to build it. Uh, I think that's the, the key there. But the, the prototype is kind of like required. If you are building a games company that's going to build games, if you don't have a prototype yet, try to figure out how you can build one before you approach investors, like for, for serious uh, discussions. You can do an angel investor talk already once you figure out the concept, but for a VC, definitely you need to have a prototype. Another question, can you offer advice for startups looking at serious games for children in terms of pitching and understanding the difference in go-to-market strategies? I think here as well, you want to figure out who, what, what has happened in uh, the market of serious games for children so far. And you want to understand the problems for the, the companies who tried to make money there. You need to really be an expert on those problems because otherwise you're going to be reinventing the wheel and you're going to have the same problems that you could have researched already on. So I would start from there, just understanding where did they suffer? Where did they do the right things? Like there are, you know, companies like Toka Boca for gaming in kids. Uh, I think they were having a really nice momentum, but I haven't heard from them for a while. Why was that? Just start asking questions from your own network, find people who know people and get introductions and, and you know, collect a lot of data. I, that's my advice there. Uh, final question here. Uh, through what way would you currently approach angel investors? Wait around for events or just email? I would look up people who uh, have, well, the force first off, there are no like lists of angel investors publicly available. Uh, what I recently did was I, I knew a, two of two games companies in, in Helsinki who had raised money from angel investors. So I asked the founders separately that, hey, how many angels did you have? Could you introduce me to them so I could have a chat? And they both had like 15 different angel investors. And I started like talking to them. Um, the approach there for you should be that you need to have a really good reason to, to start asking other people about their angels. But I think it's, there will be a lot of sharing happening if you go and ask them. Uh, that's one way. So ask fellow uh, uh, entrepreneurs in gaming if they have angel contacts. I think that's the best way to do that. Uh, of course, the angels won't be publicly saying that they're angel investing because otherwise their LinkedIn would be crazy, like full of messages. So it, it is a cautious thing. Uh, I, I wouldn't go to events for that. It's like you can do so much by just using email, uh, getting introductions from other people who know people. Yeah, that's the last question. Was there something in the chat here? Um, nope. 
Um, but I have one more question. Yes. Maybe, um, maybe you can uh, say something about the mindset and the attitude. Like, um, because I think many people um, who start pitching um, yeah, need to get into a specific mindset. Maybe mm -hmm. you can, yeah. Yeah, the mindset is, you know, you're building something big. I think that's, that will never backfire if you, if you do your research correctly. Uh, you, can, you can at least go after something big. And uh, even though you're building, a, you want to build a games company because you have a concept in mind. Maybe you have that board game that you want to build into to mobile. But could your pitch be more about We're building a company that basically gives the board gaming experience for mobile gamers uh, in a way that hasn't been solved yet. Like, can you pitch that rather than, hey, this is the cool board game that we're building. Can you give us money? So I think that is the right mindset that you should be going after. Um, and maybe um, a little bit more on the attitude, because you said like you have to think big. Um, like, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, it's like mm, thinking more, more like about building a company and not building a game. Maybe that's another way to phrase it, uh, that you, you're building something that will be growing each year, becoming bigger and bigger taking these steps because you're addressing something that uh, everybody else is kind of like not seeing. Taking that kind of attitude, I think, is very, very useful. And just if you have to take, take away something from this, I would, I would suggest that you build a company and not build a game. But rather, the games are sort of like the side product of the company. And maybe one more question before you answer the other two, which just came in. What yeah. about time management um, in the beginning? Because um, like if you start to pitch, that's one thing. But if you get the money, you have to be ready. Can you maybe also like uh, say something according to that? Uh, do you mean like then having? Yeah, well, in a sense, like I, I mentioned there that fundraising will take time. It's always like several months of, of, you know, there's the paperwork, there's a lot of meetings, there's decision making. Maybe you, you still want to talk to some other investors who are interested. Uh, at that same time, you're going to have like this is, it should be one person who's meeting investors, not like your whole team. Just, you know, del like delegate this process to one person, mostly the who's going to be the chief executive officer of the company, the managing director, that person should take care of the whole process and the rest of the team shouldn't go to these meetings unless it's like asked for by the investor that, hey, we want to meet the other founders of the company. Never send more person than one if it's not requested. Uh, then the rest of the team should be working on figuring out the, the market, the customer needs, and building, building the, the products. Okay, thanks. Now we have two other questions. Yeah, I think I answered the first one already, the, the events and the email for angel investors, but Enrique's question here, uh, you make it sound as if the business plan and business research was more important for investors than the game idea. Is it like that? I would say game idea, Uh, is important, but it should be part of what the company is working towards. And it should reflect something that the company is working towards. The game should fit that. And I think that is more important versus like you have this game and then the next game will be something else. But it's rather a strategy of the company because they pick the vision for the company to do something. If that makes sense, hopefully. You can ask a, another way if I didn't answer. Um, do investors ask for exclusivity? Do they ask not to contact other investors? Well, the term sheet, in a sense, is the place where investors say that, hey, we want to lead the round. And this is how much percentage we want of the company. 
So at that stage, if you sign that term sheet, then you you are sort of like obliged uh, to to give the investor that percentage if all the paperwork is finalized afterwards. Uh, they might, you know, say that in the first meeting already that, hey, we want 20% and we don't want anybody else to, to be involved. There's a lot of these kind of details that come up. Some, some investors say we're happy with 10% and we want somebody else to be involved. You know, we want somebody who knows more about what you're doing to be involved. It's really dynamics. There's ruthless investors. There's nice investors. There are investors who are going to be talking an hour and not letting you talk. There's all sorts of people out there. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, do you uh, maybe do you already experience something like that? Maybe you can Often. can share a little bit. <laughs> And that's like investors are people. So some feel they're really important and some feel that the entrepreneurs are very important. <laughs> uh, I don't want to name any names, but maybe later. <laughs> okay, cool. So does anyone have any other questions? Mm. Doesn't seem like that. Um, Joachim, do you want to add something? Um, yeah, it's like, uh, please join my newsletter on my uh, website, elitegamedevelopers.com. Uh, I'm putting out every Friday, like a, a package of information regarding startups in gaming. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff coming this Friday. So you, you should definitely check it out. Cool. Uh, there is one more question. <laughs> yes, let's take, let's do it. Uh, Enrique is asking, do you look for game ideas to join as fundraiser business partner? Um, I don't really understand the question. Maybe like I've, I've done some angel investments, uh, not, not so many recently. Uh, I'm focusing a lot on the elite game developers building the, the company to help founders. Um, so in a sense, I have advised a few companies as well. So uh, it is the, not the main functionality that I do personally, but there's, there's a lot of people who, if you talk to people who are experienced in the game industry and ask for their help for, hey, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. Can you advise me? I can give you some advisor shares in the company if you start, you know, doing some helping for us. You could approach something like that. Okay, perfect. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated. Um, it was really, really cool. It was actually also our first uh, webinar, <laughs> yeah. the first webinar of uh, GamesNet. So yeah. yeah, thank you very much for giving this workshop. And um, yeah, like you had, uh, like you, you showed your contacts, I think too. And um, this video will be on YouTube. We will post the link and you will also share the link and the presentation. Yes. So yeah. yeah right. Thank you to everyone. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good day. Stay safe. Bye-bye.